or just a, a bit of housekeeping, this session will be recorded. Your phones. Uh, please ask any questions in the chat box. Uh, questions will be answered at the end of the call and any questions that are not answered will be posted on the GPTA return to travel uh, think tank site. And now I'd like to hand over to to Charlie to introduce the session and moderate it. Uh, over to you, Charlie. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for this fireside chat, um, and especially to those who are coming back to us after the technical difficulties that we experienced uh, a few weeks ago uh, with this same chat that was supposed to take place. Um, to further on uh, on the introduction of Carmen Smith, our fearless leader, or, or charismatic Carmen, as she's known in industry circles, uh, she is the senior manager of travel and events at ICF. Um, she's ha she, Carmen has an impressive 25 plus years of experience in the travel industry, and she spent several years operating her own travel consulting firm, which includes, included advising sports teams and management, government, and commercial clientele. Prior to this venture, Carmen worked the better part of her career providing valuable insight to the travel industry as a recognized expert in the field and has personally assisted a number of companies in building state-of-the-art travel programs. In her current role, she oversees a team of travel meeting and event professionals, as well as the dedicated travel agent team, all of whom are collectively responsible for the day-to-day -day transactions of ICF's direct and indirect charge business travel. Uh, so quite a resume there. Um, then our uh, next... Um, attendee on the panel actually I, I believe is is still having technical difficulties correct me if I'm wrong Carmen I, uh, I think she's having uh, yeah I think so yeah I oh. think she's having some uh, some technical difficulties but the show must go on people and we're obviously not going to reschedule a second time uh, so actually we're going to kind of switch things up if we can just move to the next slide um, what we're going to ask of you in our audience, especially those that are in a travel management role, is to please use the raise hand button that you see at the bottom of your screen, or at least should see. Um, we're going to go through a variety of topics on today's call, uh, really just Carmen and myself. Um, Andrew, just so you're aware, being that you're, you can bring kind of a, uh, an EMEA insight uh, here, I'll, I'll probably call you in to, uh, to give your insight as well. But for those of you that are attending this call, um, as I said, in a, in a travel management role especially, we would love for you to actually interact a bit more uh, than you have in previous calls and give your insight to us as well on the topic. So uh, to get started, uh, right, Carmen, uh, you and I touched on, as well as the rest of the, uh, the committee, touched on a variety of these topics and, and obviously structured this call before we we came into it. Now, one of the things that I wanted to chat with you about is, um, and as I mentioned only about 10 or 15 minutes ago, is how the role of the travel manager has has really kind of, I mean, at least in my eyes, drastically come to the forefront and changed with the global pandemic um, going on. Maybe you can, you can clue in our attendees on how you've gone through reinventing your role at ICF and what it's meant for your, your partnerships, uh, just to, to start us off. Well, th thanks, Charlie, and, and everyone, I apologize. Uh, hope you can hear me well. I have a little bit of a hoarse voice today, and so hopefully it won't be painful for you to listen to me. Um, but for us, you know, the travel management role, I would say has been kind of under the radar, maybe unappreciated for what we do. It, it's, it's hard for people to understand what the travel manager actually does for the company in many cases. Uh, you know, from asking us, do we book travel to, you know, they just don't know. However, with this pandemic, we have, I would say, been catapulted, you know, into the forefront. So now we are at the table having the discussions. We are now the subject matter experts that we've always been. Uh, but it's now been recognized, and I think that has come into play with even duty of care, uh, having to locate travelers uh, in this situation where we have had folks that were stranded in various parts of the world, and and that piece of duty of care and, and coordinating that with our executive leadership team, who you'll hear me refer to as ELT. No, definitely, uh, it um, what you said at the beginning there, Carmen, I can tell you uh, within Citizen M, uh, we, we have a variety of teams that um, 
you know, de development and investment. We have uh, obviously our finance team. We have human resources. Uh, I mean, pretty much every department you could think of in, in your typical or not so typical hotel uh, environment. And I get the question all the time as to what people like you do, um, what exactly is their role? I mean, how do they communicate with travelers? And I actually once located an article that listed about 15 different roles that travel managers take on. And I'm sure that they're, they're, it's even more extensive now. Would you, would you agree? Oh, definitely. And, and to your point, uh, we are actually, we have a working group uh, that we have in our company that includes HR, it includes contracts and administration, it includes our travel and security uh, teams, it includes uh, just a number of folks uh, that are on that HR because we have to deal with so many questions. You know, what happens if somebody gets sick while they're traveling or, you know, and that becomes an HR situation or, you know, what does you know what does our contract say when we have a customer that we have to fulfill an obligation so we do have those types of conversations across the board and again we it, it, it's a collaborative effort now and uh, we are at the table and we are able to be part of those conversations changes of policies you know what policies have taken place for us originally we were a non-mandated program now it is a mandated program and you know you have to use if you're traveling because all travel has actually been suspended but if you have to travel and it is essential that you travel then it now requires a divisional level approval and it has to be done through the icf travel program so okay. those are the things that we are discussing uh andrew who you mentioned before andrew sits in london he is the travel manager for our Europe and Asia team. And so what we've done is we've gotten together and looked at the language also in our policies to make stronger languages, you know, uh, what you can and can't do, uh, what we are recommending. That is still up for approval, but we have added stronger language to our policy as a result. Amazing. Yeah, no. And I, uh, I'd actually like to ask our attendees, um, the, the ones that are in a a travel management or maybe procurement role, maybe you could get, you guys could put in the chat uh, as we continue our conversation here, if you has, have as well um, altered your travel policies as well, because that's, that's a very interesting topic. I mean, I feel that um, with so much going on at once, um, you know, that, that is probably top of mind for a lot of, a lot of travel, uh, a lot of travel programs out there. Um, yeah, it looks like we uh, we're having some reactions to that. So, Carmen, you're uh, you're not alone. <laughs> so I did want to actually, though, go back to something that you mentioned in terms of at the beginning of the um, the pandemic and in terms of getting getting your travelers back home or, or relocating them to safer areas, communicating with them. I mean, how are you? It, it, let, let's talk right now on, on the date that we're in uh, date and time that we're in. How are you communicating to your concerned travelers right now? What are you telling them? I mean, are you having an influx uh, yet of uh, anywhere in the world that people are coming to you and, and really pushing to be maybe allowed more easily to travel or, or concerned with travel? I mean, I'll, I'll let you take it away, Carmen. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So there's a number of components, as I stated, you know, there are a number of departments that are involved in those decisions. So we have created a what we call a coronavirus website so that travelers or anyone that has a question, there's an email that is specific to coronavirus. We put together some FAQs that are related um, and, you know, just in coordination again, the duty of care. We work with our programs in terms of who's out there, who has, you know, who has been um, stranded, because there's a number of things that have to be, that have to come into play. It's not just travel, but now we have somebody that may be working remotely for a certain number of time that now it becomes a situation of a tax uh, liability or, you know, in, in that regard. So getting, uh, without getting into too much, um, with that, there are other departments now that have become involved. In, and so it not only just becomes a travel situation, but it becomes a security situation. Uh, it becomes a visa situation. What are the immigration? You know, the, this person was just visiting uh, and they are an American citizen and now they're caught in this country and can't get home. You know, those are the kinds of things that, that we have, that we help facilitate and answer those questions. Um, 
we have our, a great travel agent team, you know, using that are that are dedicated to us, and they know um, international travel. They know how to answer the questions, you know, for our customers who have those questions. Um, but again, for us, travel pretty much has been halted. Uh, right. So anything that's not essential has has really has really been put on hold. Um, anyone that has to travel and and for for us, what we say as essential or what I would say permissible travel, as has been uh, framed by um, you know our festive road colleagues out there who are part of a consulting firm, permissible travel. So we do have some commercial obligations or government obligations where we have projects that they actually have to start uh, doing work. Now, what has transpired a little bit differently is that folks are doing more driving and more hotels as opposed to flying. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of the things that one of the things that are it, that's one of the part of our language that's in our particular um, policy, and it's been there pre COVID, is that any traveler or person that does not feel comfortable traveling, um, they don't have to. So that becomes part of the conversation too. Do you even feel comfortable getting on a plane? Do you feel comfortable, you know, taking a car? What are uh, the safest ways for you to travel? Car rentals, the cleaning, you limit the amount of people that you're around, you limit the um, exposure, you know, from an airport that may have a lot of people in there. So there's just a number of conversations. Uh, my team is aware we attend a lot of panels, uh, calls like this, just to keep us updated. Our partners keep us updated with uh, things that are going on. In fact, prior to this call, I was just on a call with one of our airlines talking about their updates and what they're doing for cleanliness. I actually took a tour uh, last week or the week before at one of the local airports here at the actually at Reagan National with one of the airlines and we went behind the scenes oh, to wow. see what see what their cleanliness is, what they're doing to ensure travelers or to help alleviate any fears or discomfort. So we're, as a team, doing things during this time, even though there's not travel happening, so to speak, we are working on projects or initiatives that will set us up for the future because we are proactively looking uh, toward the future. And what does travel, what is travel going to look like? How, how have we evolved? I, uh, Can I just uh, say something, Charlie? Uh, Leslie has joined Andrew, the call. Take away. Take no, away. no, Leslie. Just wanted to let you know Leslie's joined the call. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so Leslie can uh, can join our chat. Leslie, can 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 Leslie speak? Can she? Yeah. Can we hear her? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So Leslie, we were just touching on. Um, uh, exactly. I mean, I'm sure you heard most of what Carmen was just saying, but what we were kind of touching on uh, was the the restart of uh, how the restart of travel will alter the role of the travel manager and uh, and the kind of communications that that uh, people like yourselves are giving to uh, concerned travelers. So maybe you can uh, you can enlighten us on how you're doing the same at JLL. Sure. I, I think the role of the travel manager is going to consistently evolve evolve, and it gives all travel buyers those in procurement. Uh, opportunity to kind of reimagine the role itself. Um, currently, um, the goal is to ensure that the infrastructure for each region of the world is up and running and has been tweaked or adjusted to meet the changing needs of the business. And that might be a shift from four-star properties to three-star properties. It might be a shift from three to four, depending on your organization's culture or what the focus is currently. Right. And then that is the role. So the role is going to be strategic. It's going to be um, ever evolving. And it really puts gives us a seat at the table um, yeah. as procurement folks, as travel um, folks, but really concerned about how can we assist the business. So the focus is, yes, on supplier relationship, but in relationship to how we help the business be successful. Absolutely. And uh, two things. Number one, Leslie, excuse me for being rude and not properly introducing you. So if we can back up a couple of slides, Carly, so I can properly introduce our guest. Uh, Leslie Andrews, Global Travel Category Practitioner at Jones Lang LaSalle. Uh, Leslie possesses over 20 years experience in the hospitality industry and higher education, serving in various leadership capacities from Global Travel Category Leader for JLL to Academic Dean for an international school 
Currently serving as global category leader for JLL, an ad hoc professional development trainer, consultant, and coach. Academic experience includes college instruction, curriculum design, faculty development, and mentoring of adult learners. Welcome, Leslie. Well, thank you. And um, a sincere apology for me being um, delayed in my arrival. No but, worries. Uh, excited for this conversation. Definitely. Uh, we as well. And um, number two is the top just today how travel managers really worldwide are, are saying exactly what you said, how they can assist the business maybe in different ways than they were doing before, and how they're noticing their roles have altered ever since the uh, the beginning of the pandemic. So it's it's great to hear that, that you kind of felt uh, uh, somewhat of the same way. Um, to kind of finish this one bullet point that we were on, on the uh, how the, the restart of travel is altering the role of the travel manager, um, I guess it, it's kind of a, a crystal ball question for you two ladies, but um, we kind of touched on it on one of our pre-calls, and it was brought up by who was going to be our third panelist, a, a lady named Catherine, um, the proper vision board for travel managers moving forward. Um, and obviously, like I said, a, a bit of a broad statement vision board, but I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on, on where you see uh, your role maybe further altering um, and how, as Leslie put it, you can, you can further help the business. Leslie, why don't we start with you this time? Sure. Um, I believe that there's an opportunity for those who are responsible for travel management to uh, welcome and really request scope creep, if you will. So outside of air, car, hotel and meetings, you do want to be actively involved in health and safety. You do want to get that um, executive level exposure and develop creative ideas, even with your suppliers, to meet the changing needs of the business. So as you build innovative ideas, you have an opportunity to pitch those appropriately, internally and externally, and to really have an impact to make a difference and add to your credibility on your personal brand and the brand of the organization that you represent. So that's that's a real huge systemic shift. It, it requires some work, of course, for those who are managing travel, but it's well worth the effort. For years, corporate travel wanted a seat at the business table. And here's an entree for that to be a reality for all of us. So if we become quite worldly and really understand the dynamics of business, and intermingle that with our understanding of air, car, hotel, and the travel ecosystem, then that's where the opportunity lies. That's where the innovations are. They're not in what we did 20 years ago or even five years ago. We have to consistently look forward and reimagine the role in relationship to what your organization culture is in relationship to what's needed by the business. Absolutely. I mean, and, and I think that globally, I mean, we're, we're adapting to so much as it is. I mean, in terms of, of the, the travel manager's role, I mean, it, it, it's, it's also true, you know, at the end of the day. I, I could not agree more with everything that you just, you just mentioned. It's constant adaptability. Um, Carmen, your thoughts as well. Well, just to kind of uh, piggyback what Leslie said, it really is predictive analysis and, you know, looking at how can we support the business. Uh, I think both of us are in very diversified businesses. You know, we are global consulting, but we, we are, our footprint is, is, is very broad, broad and vast. And so understanding what those businesses are and what their needs are, which could be very differently. Um, I sit in headquarters, but maybe our folks over in Belgium or our folks in Houston or wherever they may be in the world, their needs may be different based on the culture, uh, based on the region. And so it, it comes to understanding that uh, also something that came up just yesterday in the conversation, you know, that I had uh, with someone in the company, it's, you know, where, where are we going? Because as Leslie stated, it's no longer business as usual. It's no longer the business that we had 20 years ago, but where are we revolving? What does that look like? I mean, for example, meetings, you know, with all of the restrictions on large meetings, you know, we have to get into looking at virtual world, you know, so what, you know, all of us as we are right now on a virtual call. Uh, so where does that 
you know, where does that play in the role? You know, technology, I think, is going to be a, have a big role in some of the things that we're doing now. And, and I think we have to, as Leslie, if I can coin her phrase, reimagine. Um, and I think the sky is the limit, but we have to use those initiatives, look at those opportunities. It's kind of like a gold mine. You know, you have to go in and, 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 and go in and, and, and look for that gold and look for those nuggets. Uh, but it is really about supporting the business and how can we make each of our businesses um, better and, and, and having that ear. And I think now um, we have shown that we are very capable. We have shown that we are truly subject matter experts. And so it's kind of like EF Hutton. Now, you know, we have the audience. They are listening. Our executive teams are listening. Uh, what we say now matters, and they see the importance of that, and that travel is not just a byproduct. It's, it's, it's really an integral part of business, and money can be lost. Um, it is, it's inextricably tied to the bottom line, and I think that's the way we have to continue to look at travel. Absolutely. And uh, just to touch on what I'm seeing here in the chat, ladies, uh, before you jumped on, Leslie, we were talking about any changes being made to travel policies. And, and the vast majority uh, in the chat are noting that they, they do require extra levels of approval, that they have made changes in their policies. Uh, one, one of our guests did say... Um, did mention that uh, they, they made no changes to their policy. Um, and then we have one final comment from Jan that says recognition of travel management is long overdue. And Jan, I could not agree more. I could not agree more. And I'm sure Leslie and Carmen agree as well. Um, to move on to our next bullet point, um, something that I mentioned before this call started uh, that I'm really looking forward to being enlightened on on this call, because I'm not all that knowledgeable about it, is uh, medical and travel security services firms. Um, ladies, I'm curious how with your dealings with these firms, such as World Aware, ISOS, and perhaps, Andrew, you can even enlighten us from a European perspective. I mean, how, how, are, how is the, the relationship with them changing? I mean, are you doing anything different? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, any way that you're working with them, maybe that you weren't before. Uh, Carmen, let's start with you this time. I'm actually going to, and this is a great segue, I'm going to actually let Andrew speak Perfect. to that because he, he's handling that for us. And so I'm going to let Andrew answer that question, if you don't mind. Not at all. Oh, no, okay. not at all. Thank you. Um, over the over this uh, period of time, I think it's come front and center, the vital importance of the ability of an organization to be able to um, track travelers in event of emergency and that has been for us travel tracker but there is so much more that uh, those companies can offer they can offer you medical advice uh, visa requirements and those kind of things and going forward that is going to become more and more important uh, even now going down to making sure you have all your it may sound a really trivial thing but making sure you have all your property information loaded into that system so you can see where things happen and just wanted to go back in my previous roles um, it's always been travel was came important when there was a disaster and traditionally that's what um, these systems have been used for now you can see there has other advantages and companies are now truly seeing the value of it and now the other part of that is of having a consolidated program or at least capturing all your bookings and having them sent over to to these organizations if you don't have the information you can't you can't you can't do anything with it um, Working with security is vital as well. So if security need to provide details on evacuations or where people are uh, going into different parts of the world, these companies can provide advice, not only on travel, but on operational issues as well. So that's where I would see these going. And going forward, they're even going to become even more critical, not just responding to security, but medical. Uh, the other one that's rarely ever spoken is malaria. And in the past, in my previous organizations, malaria and how deadly that can be was it was almost overlooked by people. Uh, so I found it very important that you have a wide range of looking at uh, these services and not when just you have an immediate need for it. Uh, anyway, sorry, I, I probably waffled on a little bit, but that's that's my take on it. No, no, the not the at bottom all. line actually, of it I is think... you, you I, as a as a company, I don't see how you can actually operate. Uh, and be able to provide advice to scene leaders without having this kind of information that these companies provide. 
And I just while I wasn't I, actually on camera, I was I was talking with my hands waving in front of the screen. Anyway, I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> no, no worries. And I was going to, to ask. Um, so in, in your opinion, I, I'm assuming based on everything you just said, that a, a lot of people that are in a role similar to you and Carmen and Leslie have perhaps had their eyes open by the current situation that we're in and perhaps are, are engaging with, with organizations like this much, much more for. Oh God, yes. Um, I what I can say now, we have we I've always had regular contact, but we have uh, scheduled calls now on topics, and it's just not uh, oh we'll get together and have a nice little chat. It's about very certain things that we want to find right. out more information for the organisation. Right. Okay. Yeah. No. As as we. Um, I'll see you. On organizations at, uh, at JLL. Um, I missed the last piece of that question, but um, in, in reference well, to yeah. in reference to speaking to the um, ISOSs of the world and the other, uh, I believe World Aware was just purchased by a Canadian group, but right. these type of organizations are key in, in understanding what's the risk out there. So working with your risk, HR, and security, the three, the trifecta, that's going to really um, set you up for success because you'll get all three viewpoints. And having those three viewpoints will enable you to be develop a strategy that's specific to the organization. Also, I'm a big fan of having more than one source. So many will say, I need one true source. At times, you may need two sources, especially if it's a complicated issue. So therefore, you'll have all of the facts or as many of the facts as possible so that you can make an, an informed choice as to what pathway is best for the organization. So in this most current situation, um, we've used Helix and also ISOS. So the two, they weren't diabolically different in reference to their um, recommendations and guidelines, but at least you had two sources of information to really validate your strategy moving forward. So that's the benefit of having more than one true source in this particular instance, especially if it's complicated, so that you're able to synthesize and develop strategy. Sorry about that. I was on mute. No. Um, I, I agree with everything that both Leslie and um, Andrew have said. It's, 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 it's a more critical role. And, you know, to that point, um, I, I think having those choices is, is important, you, uh, you know, to validate uh, information, to know that the information that you're getting is, is in line with uh, what's being said. Um, and you always have to verify, you know, my my old boss, uh, TJ Leach, used to say, trust, but verify. And I think that's important. You, you trust the source that you have, but you also want to verify, you know, whether it's are we going in the right direction or are we off chart? Um, you know, what, what is the rest of the world doing? Uh, and and are you really in line with and uh, answering the, the questions that need to be need to be answered? Um, so, as Andrew said, we have a scheduled, regularly scheduled, actually a weekly call now where before, you know, we would call and just say, hey, we need this or we need that. We're also finding about the different types of tools that these companies offer that maybe we weren't quite as interested in before, but now it's become critical. So I think this whole thing has just had made us rethink things, um, reevaluate what we're doing as a company reevaluate what we're doing as a program um, and and just really, um, you know, it, it has to be an evolution of mindset. Uh, our paradigms have to shift because if we continue 
the way we used to, we will be left behind and we won't be able to answer or to address the many problems that could come up. So I think with the whole pandemic just in general, I think we have to use this as a catapult or a catalyst to re-envision everything um, and, and to be more forward thinking and to be, and be less reactive. Because I think that's what we have been um, historically in the travel industry is reactive. And now we have to think about, okay, what will happen in the next situation, whether it's a pandemic or another crisis, what are we thinking about and what do we have in place as infrastructures to be able to move forward in so that it doesn't incapacitate us as we have been in some cases here. We have to be able to, how do we move forward and how are we able to be nimble in these types of situations? And I think partnering with the World Awares and with the ISOSs and, and others, um, it's, it's, it's very critical. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's the key word really is proactivity. I mean, it, and it goes through all segments of travel, whether it's supplier, uh, travel manager, TMC. I mean, I think we're all learning a valuable lesson the hard way, unfortunately, but I think that we're all learning a very valuable lesson that proactivity is, is really, really key in so many facets of what we do. So uh, I could not agree more. Um, now, I, in the interest of time, I do want to move on to our third bullet, which is an important one. And Carmen, I'm going to start with you because you kind of actually already touched on it. Um, you mentioned that you just did a tour at Dulles Airport near where you live. And, um, you know, we, I'd love for us to go into what a lot of people are calling uh, these days the traveler journey, if they weren't already, um, regarding their experience, their expectations, their concerns, you know, things of that nature. So, what are you noticing? I mean, we're seeing a lot of things in the news, but maybe just you directly, Carmen, and then we'll ask Leslie as well. Uh, what are you noticing that vendors are doing to make sure that their environments are safe and hygienic? And, and how sustainable do you feel that they are? And then, you know, what, what have maybe you have even further expectations uh, in terms of, of hygiene and sustainability? Well, that's a great question, Charlie, and and I would say consistency, but you hit the nail on the head in terms of sustainability, um, because my, my first question is, well, what have you guys been doing before? You know, uh, anybody that's been on an air, airplane has seen some kind of nasty stuff, and you're just kind of <laughs> wondering, uh, you know, what have you guys been doing, you know? So, so for me, <laughs> you know, the cleanliness of it, the uh, I would like to see the upkeep of it, you know, and, and this is a, it's a minor thing. <laughs> but loading the plane from the back to the front has always been a pet peeve of mine because it, it just makes more sense logically. It's like, you know, then you don't have to worry about the overhead space because somebody has space and, you know, you're moving backwards to forward. You can still have your, um, you know, your first class passengers and actually, honestly, um, getting on last and being the first ones off is, is, is a, a sense of, of social distancing in and of itself. Um, I was on a panel uh, through, it was called TAMS. It was a task uh, that we put together. I'm um, familiar. With, yeah, so Susan Lichtenstein, for those of you who know her, put together a, ta uh, a task team. And what we did is we put together industry standards of things that we would like to see standardized across the board from rail to hotel to airlines. And my team was, you know, the, the airlines piece of it. And so we looked at not only uh, above the wing, which is your customer service going from the door to the gate to, you know, to all of those components, but what happens under the wings? What happens if you check your bag and what happens, you know, where does that go? So it has to be, all the different touch points. I, I like the fact that you can use your phone to do a um, to get your your tickets or I'm sorry your your baggage tickets. You can actually scan your phone without touching uh, the kiosk. So I just think there's a number of things that that I would like to see remain in place. I don't know how sustainable it is, you know, from a cost perspective. Uh, you know, someone mentioned that one of the airlines actually increased their tickets by $100 to accommodate that. Certainly we know all of this isn't free, but I think there should be a higher standard. And it also, too, Charlie, makes you realize how really susceptible we are to a lot of things. I mean, we travel, we were on packed planes, people back then, you know, still coughing and sniffing and just a number of things taking place. So we really have always been at risk. And so anything to keep us um, 
you know, better covered, uh, better protected. Those are the things that I would like to see. Uh, again, too, something as simple as loading from the back of the plane. It may seem like a small thing, but these are things that add actually to efficiency uh, and, 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 and just, you know, streamlining things. I'm all about streamlining anybody that knows me. I love to, to make things streamlined. So anything that would make that process more streamlined and safe for us would be what I would like to see going forward. Without a doubt. I mean, it, and it is amazing to think, I mean, even watching movies these days, you, you see a big crowd of people in a city and it just looks so, I guess the word is surreal. You know, it looks like something that you, you simply, we simply haven't experienced in, in such a long time. So it's, it's, it's definitely, I mean, you hit the nail right on the head, at, at least in terms of what I'm thinking. Now, in terms of what you've seen so far, Carmen, I mean, you mentioned the tour of the airport. I'm sure you're in touch with your hotel suppliers. I mean, are, are you, I guess, I don't know if the best word to use, but I'm going to use it. Are you satisfied with what you've seen so far? Well, I, I actually have traveled um, since this. I would say it's, it, it's inconsistent. Um, the enforcement of mask. Uh, the airlines, I think, are doing a good job with that, of having masks on, requiring people and letting people know that you will not be boarded if you don't have your mask on. Um, you could be on a no-fly list if you don't have your mask on. But hotels, I would think, I would say, are the most inconsistent. Um, you know, they do have signage up, for example, two people in an elevator at a time or a family in the elevator. But I just traveled by car. Um, I did go by air also, but by car mostly. And I'm going to tell you, I walked in and I think my family was the only one with mask on. To me, that's a scary thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so if everybody is not participating, then I think this is going to precipitate, you know, for a long time going forward because it's, it really has to take um, everyone. And, and, and one of the things that was really critically important that came up, and it's a conversation that we also have from an HR perspective and other, you know, what happens if someone doesn't, can't wear a mask for medical reasons or whatever. And one of the airlines that I was on a call with today, they said, they're, it's not, then in that case, it's not safe and you can't fly. So if you can't wear a mask, I think they're making those kind of drastic measures that they're not allowing people on at all. Um, and so those are conversations from an HR perspective or from a travel perspective. You know, what happens if someone just can't wear a mask? You know, how do you deal with that? Because that can get into a number of things that I, you know, far above, you know, what I, I can, you know, I would say far above my pay grade, I would say. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but I would say hotels are probably by far the most inconsistent. Right. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, car rentals, I didn't have an issue. I felt they, they had their stickers there that showed the cleanliness. They, uh, when I rented a car, I felt comfortable in it. It was clean. Uh, the social distancing was there. Um, and so I felt, I felt more comfortable with the airline and with um, the car rental hotels was uh, unfortunately the most inconsistent. Sure, no, and we're gonna revisit that because we have an Ed Bazanko in the chat uh, mentioning something along with those inconsistencies. So when Tanya goes through the questions at the end of the uh, fireside chat we're having, uh, we'll, we'll revisit that topic. Um, and then a Kim Pontel just noted that Marriott and, and Hilton have just mandated mass across the board. So hopefully, um, you know, even even these, I mean, as we know, they're, they're big franchisers. So hopefully everybody is going to adhere to those rules. Um, Leslie, I'd love to move on to you um, and see, you know, basically the same question, you know, what you're noticing uh, in terms of um, your vendors making sure their environments are safe and hygienic and, and what your expectations are and not just yours, but of course, what you're hearing from your travelers. Sure. Um, the expectations, as uh, Carmen Bay mentioned, is a consistency across air, car and hotel. Um, the airlines seem to have gotten it together. Everyone's talking about the grade of their HEPA filters. Um, yes, they've had HEPA filters all this time, but now it's the grade of HEPA filter and a little bit of one upsmanship. One airline's trying to do a little bit more than the next, than the next, but they're all on the same path. So it's my hope that eventually, and I think there's talk that um, the big three will get together and have some minimum standards that they're going to abide by. 
I am concerned about the savings on the middle seat. I think that gave uh, travelers more of a feeling of safety. I'm not saying that it was it's true, but at least you have an understanding that you're um, a little social distance there because that middle seat was left empty. So I think uh, September 30th, um, some folks are going to um, have that practice until that timeline. However, um, some say they're going to go beyond that. Um, we'll see <laughs> if they are consistent. Um, some will say, well, if we get to 70 percent full on a flight, we're going to allow you to change it for no fee and so forth. And the question would be, change it to what? <laughs> if, because capacity has truly shrunk drastically. Oh, so yeah. we're kind of in a holding pattern and we'll see how that works as folks um, get back on the aircraft and they start to travel. Now, on the other side, we have the um, hoteliers. The hoteliers are all over the place. Um, the America's Hotel and Lodging Association, they have come out with some minimum standards, but it's like, who's going to enforce that? Who is going to double, triple check? Same thing with the, the brands. Um, the hotels, for the most part, are franchise. So what's going to be the penalty of non-compliance, possibility of losing your flag? Perhaps that's something that the big hotel chains will state to all of their brands. If you don't meet this minimum standard, then you're going to lose our, the flag. But that hasn't been stated overtly. So the question is, what's the penalty for non-compliance in reference to health and safety? Um, do they have the manpower to actually deliver on cleaning those spaces and the public spaces more frequently? Um, are they really going to allow a room to sit for 24 hours before they actually go in and clean it? So that's all questionable. And who's who's checking the industry to ensure that that's that's the case? Perhaps a third party might be a good business plan for a new business, <laughs> and actually um, build something like that to to check to ensure that uh, these standards are are consistent. In reference to car rental, as Carmen made mention, no issue there at all. Um, they're consistent. It's it's a car. You clean it. They've been cleaning cars for some time. Let's let's pay more attention than we have in the past. But you're keeping with the same regimen. Yeah. So it may be may use a static uh, a defogger now, but uh, you're still in essence cleaning that car every single time. So that is uh, what I noted um, in reference to the different brands. The independent brands I think have a harder harder case uh, to make sure that they are. Um, maintaining the right standards or hygiene for each of their hotels, the independent brands, and because there's no there's no mothership saying you must do X, so who's going to again check that? So we have sure. the little inconsistencies in the hotel side. Uh, we have the air carriers trying to say get on the aircraft. We we've we've got you in reference to safety and hygiene, and the car rentals are in a good spot, but the hotels. Ah, they need to pull together independent, you, the big brands. You, <laughs> you hoteliers on this call, you're making me look bad, man. You are making me look bad. You better get your acts together, you know. <laughs> Sounds like a new business <laughs> for somebody uh, out there. <laughs> number two is uh, I actually – I actually wanted to uh, to touch on what you were saying, Leslie, because I, I so when the pandemic first hit, I took it upon myself to try to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with as many of my clients as I could, and I heard exactly what you just said from many of them, which is maybe we need a third party to come in and check the consistency of these standards, um, because quite frankly, a lot of them mentioned that, especially with the large chains where you have thousands of hotels. How how are you going to maintain that? How are you going to check on that? It it is and I mean we're we're sitting here giggling with each other, but it really is a good question. It really is a very relevant question, and and I'd be interested to see how that's going to play out over the next months and years. Uh, one one suggestion was similar to they do with restaurants with the A, B, and C rating. Maybe you slap that on a hotel. You know, okay, it's got an A rating. I'm comfortable sending my people there. You know, so. Um, yeah. it's, it's very interesting. And like I said, I, and there are some businesses out there. Ladies, in the interest of time, out, we do need well, to move on. Has a building safety. Yeah. Division. 
So that's something there that uh, Dwell has already built. Maybe they'll build out that business plan just a little further to uh, yeah. cover, cover hotels like, globally. There we said, like we said, Leslie, consistency is key. Absolutely. So <laughs> the last topic we're going to visit on is, of course, uh, everyone's favorite topic. And by that, I mean probably least favorite, which is the RFP process for 2021. Uh, the reason I wanted to make this part of the fireside chat for everybody listening is um, obviously before we have these calls, we kind of have pre-calls. And I found that it was very interesting that it was originally supposed to be three panelists. I found it very interesting that one of them Im immediately said that uh, she's likely forego she was foregoing the RFP, while another said that she had just actually completed hers. So uh, obviously also a degree of, uh, of controversy out there when um, a few months ago, GBTA made the announcement that they advised against moving forward with an RFP process. So for the first time in, in a long time, at the very least, there was a degree of controversy to it as well. So Leslie, let's start with you this time. Um, RFP, are you going with it? Are you just having everybody extend? Is it a mix of both? And how do you feel that your suppliers are, are actually trying to to woo you back dur maybe during the RFP process or not to the skies, cars, and hotels? Mine, that's a loaded question. It I is. Would say, <laughs> I, would, I would say in, in reference to um, the RFP, let's, let's stick with hotels. Um, sure. So the big chains have said, you know, we're just going to roll the rates over. Um, and they don't have the infrastructure to support the RFP process. Um, However, if you need to get an RFP done, I'm sure it can get done somehow. I would um, have to so that's something that you make a decision based upon your strategy for 2021. Um, and the understanding that uh, it's, it's going to be challenging and not, the answer is not true for everyone. It's sure. an individual answer that's aligned to your program. And there is another way going outside the RFP process to negotiate key properties within your program for 2021. So if you go the formal route, perhaps the major change, and they've all said we're rolling rates, all of them, uh, for the most part, then um, it could be an opportunity to consider some independence then as alternatives, those who are willing to take that RFP stand. So that's an opportunity. Um, so you can make a shift. And in that shift, perhaps there is a lower price point. But then along with the price point, you have to be concerned with, is that hotel going to remain uh, clean standards? So you have to look at the whole package Absolutely. and determine whether or not what's the strategic way forward that's going to meet the needs of your business travelers. All it takes is what? One legal issue, one COVID, or one something else. So we, we have to really be clean about it. So RFP for 2021, um, yes and no. Yeah, no, and, and, and to be expected, really. I mean, honestly, I think you answered it perfectly. It's not, it's not the same for everyone, you know? It, it really isn't, it, it, and it, it probably never will be, even not during a pandemic, you know? I definitely agree with you. Now, the only other thing before I ask Carmen and then we move on to the Q&A is, are you drastically altering the questions that you typically ask with your RFP to hotels and airlines and car? You know, if you're using a tool like Lanyon, they've added 60. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 60 hygienic questions. Um, and if you're doing something else, let's say you're individually negotiating with their property, you want to be sure that you're covering what's important to your health and safety teams, tie it back to your organization, what's important, and therefore you carry that out in your RFP consistently or you carry it off in your discussions with that individual properties. Sure. So um, airfares or airlines, RFPs for uh, 2021, um, they're really wanting to hold off for a year across the board and keep things as they are until we build up uh, some historical record as to what's the new world gonna look like. Everyone's shrunk by at least 30% in reference to capacity. Um, so that's where we are there. I think the interesting question is the TMC RFP process. How, how is the business model B2B going to shift? How is it going to change and alter? Yeah, no, an incredible question. And uh, 
I guess, you know, being that we're already in July, more to come. So we'll we'll see where uh, where life takes us in that process. And I won't give my opinion on shifting from the big chains to the independents. I have no comment on that at all. Uh, so we'll move on to <laughs> Carmen. Uh, Carmen, I won't I won't go um, ask the second part of the question, which was the wooing uh, travelers back to the airs, cars and hotels. Leave that to me. That's my job. But let's stick to the RFP question, which was, um, you know, are you conducting an RFP? I believe you were the one that said that you already did conduct your RFP process. And I see you nodding in agreement. Now, maybe the question to you is a bit different, Carmen. Did you approach the process differently and how so? So we, first of all, first of all, for us, even though we do the larger RFP at the, it, typically in September or the end of the year, we always keep our RFPs open uh, just because as, as properties change or there's new properties that come on, um, I am, and I, I am un, unapologetically a hotel snob. I, I tell everybody that. So regardless of the class of sir, class of the hotel, would I stay there myself? That's the first thing. Um, Andrew and I both, we went through a very methodical um, look at each and every property. I do have a mixture of chains and independents because I, I think independents offer something that the chains may or may not offer. Um, also the safety of it. I look at the ratings. Uh, this is hotels I'm talking about for the, for the larger audience. Um, so we took a lot of time and we actually just finished uh, our RFP, uh, really the finalization of it, probably January. And so when the pandemic hit, there was no way I was going back through that. Now, with the caveat on that, some of the hotels that we picked had closed, at least during the pandemic. So one of the things that we will have to look at are, are those hotels still open? Um, have they changed their name or their brands? And do I still want them in my program, you know, after that? But I think from a activity perspective, we have none. So the goal of that, and, and, and our hotel program was actually very small. We expanded it quite a bit, which is what why it took, it took so long. And so we wanna give those efforts a chance uh, to, to materialize. And so, you know, unfortunately, uh, when COVID hit, everything shut down for the most part. And so we don't have any idea you know what the how those hotels how we participate how those hotels you know treat us in in many cases not all of them were historical properties that we had so for us it was a fresh look and um and an expansion so we want to give that a, a true honest effort and take a look at that as things start to pick up uh and look at look at you know who's still in there um as far as our airlines we did just move that down again. Uh, all of our airlines extended theirs probably for the next year. But to Leslie's point, you know, we are going to have to look at that again. You know, where are we traveling? What's going to change? What's going to be different? Um, and unfortunately for me, uh, from that perspective, I've lost my account managers. They've taken early outs and retired. Um, so I'm 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 sad about that because we had great relationships. They were great. Um, assets to our program and and to helping us look at opportunities and so you know so for me I've got to start new with someone else that's got to learn my pro program all over again so you know maybe looking at that maybe taking this time now to uh, reacclimate someone and 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 talk to them about our program and our expectations this is a good time to do that because we're not as busy or not busy in that respect. We're busy in other respects with the other initiatives that we've put forth. But um, given this, it's, it's allowing us different opportunities. Sure, and and I just want to say from a supplier side, Carmen, how rare it is right now to hear someone saying that they look to expand their program. Um, because I'm hearing the exact opposite, um, that, that people want to stick to who they've been using, they want to maintain their commitments. And I'm not saying you're not doing the same, 
Um, but it is it is a bit of a of a breath of fresh air to hear that you took a little bit of a different approach. And um, I would the only other thing I want to add is I'm a hotel snob too, so you're in good company. <laughs> so, so it's not just you. Um, now uh, we did actually have some really good engagement, as that really was our our last bullet point to touch on, ladies. So thank you so much for your input. Um, but I'll pass it over to Tanya to go through uh, some of the questions that we had in the chat. Thanks, Charlie. So we have some comments and questions, and I'll go through the comments first and then get to the questions. Um, Sean has said, Enterprise and National in regards to cars is moving from a low-touch car rental experience to a no-touch car rental experience with the safety and well-being of customers and travelers being their number one concern. No-touch means online check-ins and completing rental contracts using your mobile device. And then Jan from, I believe she's from, um, Underwriters Laboratory said that they do vet hotels and are giving them certifications. Um, she said that um, they're using a third party vetting and certifying hotels for safety and COVID-19 process and protocols. So I'm going to now get to the questions. The first question I'm going to ask um, Leslie first. What value do you place on TMC's risk management systems versus iOS slash Helix? I do believe that they're in different capacities. They're a complement, but if you're a, a, a real global organization, you may need more support. So um, ISOS is key when there is something, someone to repatriate, when you have someone else to support, then that's the opportunity to, to have um, the TMC and also ISOS or, or Helix to assist in what happens when, they're, when you do need to repatriate when you do need to do something with that information, um, rather than just you have access to the information. Thanks, Leslie. Carmen, do you have any thoughts? So yeah, we, we look at it a little bit differently, and certainly those that, that is historically what those companies have done for repay, and they've been very instrumental with us even, um, from evacuations to other situations. Um, but now what we are also looking at, you know, is, you know, how can we use them you know, differently, the types of information. Andrew talked about buildings. You know, we have, as a global company, we have offices all over the world. And so how do they help us? Also helping us look forward, you know, what are the things that we're not thinking about that we should have been thinking about but maybe didn't think about before? So if they are they are very instrumental in helping us, you know, restructure some of our um our, our processes or evacuation plans or, you know, just how, how do we look at things and, and how do we do it from a security standpoint? Uh, so I think I think that they have services that that maybe not have been maybe have been underutilized. And so now we have rediscovered uh, these companies in a different way than we maybe historically have used them previously. Great, thank you. We do have um, some a few more questions. We are running out of time, though. I don't know if we want to go ahead and address those questions now, or if we would like to answer them in the chat. Maybe, maybe one more, maybe, maybe one more, Tanya, and then we can, we can answer anything else in the chat. Sure, um, Carmen. I'm going to direct this question to you first. Travel managers, what assurance do you have that suppliers are doing what they say? Big brands have introduced great-looking programs, but are franchisees able to meet? those programs consistently. Um, can you repeat that, Tanya? I just want to make sure that I'm understanding. So um, I can I, I can actually elaborate on that, Tanya. It, Leslie, uh, excuse me, Carmen, it's, it's what we touched on earlier. His question is basically that the, the big brands have introduced great looking programs, but they're all franchised. So, you know, do you feel, do you have assurance that they're actually doing what they say? I mean, you, you kind of indicated that your your answer may be no. Yeah. So, so yeah, so it has been very inconsistent. What I would say to my hoteliers and those who are global account managers, this is where we really need uh, your help and your input. I mean, it's kind of hard and I have, I have been on the hotel side, so I've worked for hotels myself. Um, and so franchisees are different, you know, Leslie touched on this, you know, and this may be a new way of looking at things, but you know, what are, what are the ramifications of not following uh, the rules or not 
meeting the standards? Um, you know, what type of inspections are going to take place to make sure that things are standardized? And so maybe that's a different type of conversation. Um, but right now, um, I, I don't feel great about uh, the lack of consistency uh, across the board with hotels. Um, you know, certainly corporate corporate owned hotels are, you know, you can you can force them to, to, to comply. But for folks that own that hotel or, or own that separately and they're a subsidiary of or a franchise of, it, it is a little bit harder. So I would like to see maybe, um, you know, more standards across the board uh, in, in terms of, of how you're going to enforce those rules and enforce the standards. Leslie, do you have anything to add? You're on mute, Leslie. You're on mute, Leslie. <laughs> Nothing to add specifically, but just in general, you know, as travel buyers, as folks who are managing travel, um, now is the time for us to really reclaim the space, reimagine it. If you're in procurement, think about how, do, how can you do program management, expand the boundaries of your role. If you're in the program management side, how can, you be, how can you be more actively on the procurement side of the house in reference to contract negotiations and supplier management and creating innovation through those relationships that we built for so many years? How can we get to co-creation with our suppliers? So be willing to take the chance and expand and grow. And that's the opportunity to validate the value of travel management for the long haul. Absolutely. I mean, it goes back to proactivity. You know, I, I have that, proactivity and adaptability, I feel like are two keywords of this uh, of this call today. Um, I want to thank everybody that's still on the line and sorry that we've gone two minutes over. Um, I want to thank the rest of the Return to Travel Committee uh, for all of us organizing this call. I hope everybody found it as insightful as I did. Um, and of course, I want to thank charismatic Carmen Smith, and lovely Leslie Andrews for being our panelist today. So thank you ladies so much for your insight. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks, Charlie. You've done a Thanks, wonderful Charlie. job. Thank you, everyone. Oh, great. All Take right. All Everybody right. have a great rest of your day. Ciao for now. Bye-bye now. <laughs>